Hello and welcome to another Overlord Lore video and today I will speculate about one simple question. Is Eins Ulgaun alone? Or yet better, is he the only player that remains in the new world? Now we most certainly do know that Eins will never see his friends again. Something you shouldn't say to his face unless you want to find out what precisely happens in the Chamber of Truth. But this does not mean that no other players were transported to the new world. On the contrary, the Minotaur Sage who advocated for surgery, which would be an odd solution for healing the sick and the wounded, if it could be done far better and quicker by magical means, the eight Greed Kings who waged war against the Dragon Lords, the then ruler of the new world, and won, turning their base to the capital of their continent-spanning empire and the six great gods, who are believed to have saved humanity from certain death, are all basically screaming, Look, I am a player, notice me, at the reader. Especially after the highest ranking members of the theocracy called Ainz's casting of the super tier spell Yeshub Nigorov, Magic of the Gods. And according to Evil Eye, the two people that joined the 13 heroes and at one point had fought another to the death are confirmed players. Although Evil Eye still believes that players are a special race and not the most basic thing to have ever existed in the entire history of anime, manga and light novels. Somebody who has been isekai So therefore we definitively know that at one point in the history of the new world other players have been around, alive and more or less well in this plane of existence. Furthermore, the higher ups of the slain theocracy are certain that every hundred years at least another great event will lead to the reincarnation of a player into this new world. But, and this is where things are really getting interesting, not only did the two members of the 13 heroes appear seemingly simultaneously, the 13 heroes fought something called the evil deities or evil spirits, entities with the power of destroying entire nations. And apparently they were so infamous and powerful that many, many decades after they were defeated, the workers who trespassed and invaded the great tomb of Nazarek speculated that these ruins were from that time. So if their aftermath was so impactful and their appearance so sudden, that the rough story is more or less commonly known by workers even after centuries, then these evil entities could have been players as well, or at the very least NPCs from a guild base, which would mean that players could be summoned at the same time to the new world. And even better, in Overlord's third book, The Bloody Valkyrie, just before the first encounter between Eins and the recently mind-controlled Shaltir, he had to attend a guild meeting. And not only has he gotten introduced to one of his future elderlies, during the course of the conversation between the adventurer teams, the guildmaster and the magic representant, it was speculated by the pettiful mortals that if Momon the Dark Hero wields a summoning crystal capable of holding magic of unprecedented scale, then perhaps all of the other legends were true as well. Legends about a princess ruling over a castle with 12 loyal knights, about a winged hero soaring through the sky, about an evil knight riding a tree-headed dragon, and about a goblin king battling and surprisingly killing dragons with an ash branch. All of this sounds like players to me, so all of this implies that they are way more common than just one appearing every 100 years. So with this much said, where are the rest of them? Until now, Eins is the only confirmed player that is... alive? In a certain sense? And the first thing that comes to my mind while answering this question is distance and scale. We barely have seen the tip of the continent and we don't know if this is the only one or just one of many. It was also said that if Yaldabaoth had appeared on the other side of the continent, then he would have managed to stay under the radar at the other end of it. So if let's say 20 players are appearing every 100 years, 
10 of them are underleveled and 10 are somewhat around level 90 or even level 100. Then half of them might not be noticed to be players or killed by the local wildlife. Because again, even by New World standards, they would be weak. And the other 10 players might have clashed with the remaining dragon lords, other monsters or another. Or they did die of old age, since some species have apparently quite a short lifespan. Or let's just assume that, for example, the great cat girl kingdom got transported into the new world. I believe that it is reasonable to assume that the players might have just realized that all of their cat girl servants would serve them, are into them, and thus they would never need to set a foot outside of their bedroom, much less their guild base. As for the underleveled players, all they have is their potential, and thus they would be more or less forced to live in a society of some kind. Because generally speaking, for most human players, it would be far more easier to hone their incredible potential while living within human society than to go out fighting monsters or launch an all-out assault on it. Because if you're fairly weak and try to take over a city by yourself, you would almost certainly die in the process rather than succeeding with your endeavor. At least until you are strong enough to do it without a significant risk. And of course the same kind of logic applies to the heteromorphs or the demi-human players. Mankind just serves as an example. Because most players tended to play humanoid characters. So let's assume that one of the underleveled players is a level 1 newbie. We know that the players that accompanied Eveline and the rest of the 13 heroes were initially the weakest members, but they gained strength and skills at an unprecedented rate. And finally one of them became the strongest member of the group. So generally speaking, for somebody who is a level 1 smith, it is much better to integrate into human society, working some odd jobs here and there and gaining valuable experience until they made a name for themselves. For example, if our level 1 newbie was interested in smithing, then he might have picked a starting class with a starting level somewhere in the realms of wood or metalworks, weapon manufacturing or something else of this kind. And with this first job level, he or she can attempt to gain a position in some forge, where the player can quickly gain experience. Similarly, if you're more of a merchant, go to the merchant guild or ask some innkeeper if he needs an intern. If you're a mage, go to the Imperial Academy or something like that. But in any case, if you're just a regular human without any emotional inhibitor, you might get scared quite a bit by all of the dangers that are lurking outside of the city. It is simply much safer to craft arms for those that are brave enough to venture outside than taking up arms yourself and becoming an adventurer or a mercenary. Especially because a skilled blacksmith or a well-known caster will not only obtain quite a good reputation and thus many new contacts to well-known adventurers or wise old wizards, but he or she will also obtain a handsome sum of money. And in human society there's basically nothing you can't buy for money. It is the amount that matters. If the upstart rookie, after having made a name for himself, wants to read a particular treaty on magic, craftsmanship or martial arts, he does not need to kidnap people and force them to tell him their secrets. Like Sebas did, the players can walk right into the caster guild and ask for some newly created spells or some personal training from one of the more experienced witches and wizards. And this applies to anything. Maps, magic, weapons, informations about the new world, the country, your city, and of course about the current ruler, his rivals, and about politics in general. Especially in more meritocratic nations, such as the Empire, they could gain quite a bit of fame and fortune without anybody immediately noticing that they are a player. And this is also something only other players, the Dragon Lords, and some NPCs here and there could possibly realize anyway. So until you're getting in your 30s and 40s level wise and those are well known throughout your country, it would be impossible to tell if somebody is a player or not, if they started underleveled. And even then, why would you try to take over a nation or become a king? if you're already living way better than basically anybody from the old world. 
where nature has died and the air is unbreathable. Think about it. If you get sick, just pay for a healing spell or cast one yourself. If you're hungry, go eat at a fancy restaurant. Nothing will go bad since everything has cast preservation onto it. And if you have other bodily needs, well, you are a well-known, highly respected member of society. You will have many potential partners. And even if you have hit the randomize button on your character creation screen, you could always visit a high-class brothel. Especially since healing magic for certain diseases already exists. And once you have settled down and started a family, your highest priority would be to keep it safe and not to launch an all-out war against some nation. And the best part, all of this potential is amplified if you had chosen a race with a significant lifespan, such as an elf, or even better, a heteromorph, who does not age at all. So again, why would you possibly choose to risk your life in order to become burdened with all of the tasks, intrigues, and the politics a ruler has to master in order to stay in power? And again, as mentioned, you could achieve all of this high status and this good life without ever leaving the safety of your city. Another thing that might have played a significant role for why Eins hasn't encountered other players yet is that he might not had the time necessary to make themselves known to the world. After all, at the end of Volume 13, just two years had passed, so even for a dedicated level 100 player, this likely wouldn't be enough time to take over enough cities and destroy enough nations for Eins on the other side of the continent to notice them. And since Platinum Dragonlord is currently focused on Shaltir and the threat at hand, he likely wouldn't pay that much of attention to nations on the other side of the continent. Furthermore, the great nations in the middle of the continent might very well be able to at least slow down a player, if they have some godkins or artifacts left. Because even after 600 years, and after Soshana, the last remaining of the six great gods, had been killed by the eight Greed kings, the Theocracy still had some artifacts left to deal with potential players, such as Downfall of Castle and Country for example, which is one of the highly sought after world class items. So the Ash branch of the Goblin King and whatever the Minotaur Sage had with him might still be used by their offspring or their remaining allies. So while Eins is kept busy at the edge of the continent and the Dragonlords and the Theocracy are busying themselves with Eins, the occasional guest from Yggdrasil might still fly under their radar. Not to mention that if you're a player and you hear from a friend that some sort of bone boy had taken over an entire nation and that a demon emperor had appeared in your kingdom's capital, chances are you would start to look into employments in other countries, rather than trying to meet the undead overlord in person. Especially because the guild Einzulgaun was infamously known to be a PK-focused entity. So rather than risk an encounter with Nazarick, you would most likely run into the opposite direction. And with that said, I've learned this part of the video today. Next time, we will take a look at the far, far bigger problem at hand. Something that could pose a genuine threat to Ein's old gown and the great tomb of Nazarick. Other guild bases, especially those already occupied by, for example, one Dragonlord with a certain disdain for anything and anyone of Yggdrasil origin. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please go check out my second channel, link is in the description, and most importantly, have a nice day, over and out.